Hello, everyone. It's an incredible privilege to be here um, for many reasons. One, what a fantastic program today is being. Uh, but when I look around the room, I actually see a lot of familiar faces. And there's a lot of people who've really inspired me and shaped my ideas about this particular topic here in the room. So um, I'm really looking forward to talking about this with you all. Now, I'd like to do a quick survey because it's the last talk uh, before lunch break. So stand up if you're interested in elite performance. OK, so everyone who's interested in elite performance, please stand up. Now, uh, put your right hand if you're, a, if, you, if you're a clinician and you do simulation, you're either a participant or you deliver it. Now, what about if in that setting, you regularly do simulation involving consultants or attendings as the participants of the simulation. And everyone else sit down if you're not standing up with two hands. Okay, you can all grab a seat now. But I think the point there is, is that, well, it speaks for itself really, doesn't it? There's not many of us who are doing that. And uh, I want to start with this guy who's Canadian. There's many great Canadians here. This is uh, Chris Hadfield. Uh, former commander of the space station, uh, International Space Station, an astronaut, and he is the writer of a wonderful book called An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. And one of the things that struck me when I was um, reading this book really was just how embedded simulation is in the preparation of astronauts, who I think by definition are elite performers. They are elite performers before they get selected never mind the training that they do get. And he really describes it when the rockets fire up and are going up into space, there is no fear because he's worked every problem. He's had every failure. He's found the solution to everything along the way. It's just relief. He's already wearing the ultimate armor against fear and failure, which is hard-won competence in a simulation setting. But what the astronauts also do is that when they fail and learn in that sim center environment, they don't, it's not just them that learn from it. The learnings get spread to everyone and they've created this culture of being able to do that. And so I look at medicine and, you know, I think we're a complex environment too. We're high stakes. Maybe we're, maybe we're not doing things as well as we could. And obviously there's many reasons for that. So welcome to the Alfred ICU. So this is where I work. Uh, in Melbourne, we're a 45-bed ICU. Um, we're the biggest ECMO centre, the biggest trauma centre, the biggest heart lung transplant centre, all that sort of stuff in Australia. And we kind of think that we probably need to be quite good at what we do. We have over 20 intensivists. Um, we have about 20 senior registrars or fellows who can be an intimidating <laughs> bunch as well. A large number of them are post fellowship trained. I think the record is we've had one trainee who was already a specialist in four different areas before um, coming to work with us. So it's an interesting place to be an educator. And it was probably about six years ago that, um, that an attempt at involving consultants in simulation first came in. And I look back on that and think, you know, that was a pretty bold thing to do but it maybe wasn't perfect. And so that's what I'm talking about today is kind of how my ideas have evolved and maybe what we're doing differently or have changed over that time. So I've got to say that there's a little bit of a ambiguity uh, at the center of this whole talk, because what is an expert or an elite performer? And one of the key things is, is um, we know for sure that experience alone does not lead to expertise. I'm gonna use expertise in elite performance pretty much interchangeably. But there's even data that suggests that older physicians have worse patient outcomes and higher mortality than, say, physicians under the age of 40. And there's probably many reasons for that. But one of it may be, how do we actually maintain expertise in a complex, rapidly evolving field like, like critical care and medicine? There's another problem that we have, and it's related to this. So this is uh, Kenny Dalgleish by anyone stretch, one of the greatest British football players of all time. But would we think he was quite as elite as he was if he played in a different team, you know, a lesser team? 
perhaps. Uh, <laughs> 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 and, and, we, and we have this problem <laughs> in, uh, in medicine as well, isn't it? Because, sure, we can make ourselves bulletproof, but the patients don't care about that. They care about collective competence. And individual competence is necessary, but not sufficient for collective competence. We need the whole team, the whole system, the whole organization to uh, perform at an elite level. So that's some of the things I'm thinking about when I'm doing simulation uh, in my workplace. And I really come at this as a, uh, from the point of view of a, of a coalface enthusiast rather than any sort of um, uh, academic or expert, I would say. Oops, I've skipped one. So we're left there now with this. <laughs> okay, gave, gave the cat, gave it away there. So, so, we're <laughs> so we're left there with this difficult thing of knowing exactly what the definition of an expert or elite performer is. And in the end, I think it's a little bit like pornography, isn't it? You know it when you see it, or at least we think we do. Uh, but if that's, if that's controversial, moving on to the next step, how is expertise, true expertise developed? I think is now less controversial. And that's, I think, because the gold standard for me is Anders Ericsson and colleagues' work on, um, on uh, deliberate practice. And that's come from a whole lot of research and observation of how elite musicians, elite athletes, chess masters, etc., develop their expertise. And so what I'd like to go through now is really what the core components of um, deliberate practice are, because I think that integrating simulation into this concept can certainly help us develop expertise. So here's a checklist. This is what, from my understanding of reading Ericsson stuff, is what you need to become a true expert. You need highly motivated learners. Check, we have those. You need specific objectives and tasks for each period of practice. So you need to know exactly what you're trying to achieve out of that bit, and ideally break it down into small bits. Level of difficulty. Now, this is critical because in order to progress, in order to develop expertise, you need to be out of your comfort zone. You need to be working right on the limits of your ability. So that's something we need to do. It needs to be focused, repetitive practice. And this is, uh, this is critical as well because how often do we actually repeat things and what, what's the dosing, what's the timing? Often we just do it once and see you later. That's not... That's not it. And by focused, what I mean is it's not like when you're driving a car and you're just daydreaming. You're thinking about exactly what you're doing when you're doing it, what's actually working, and trying to change it and optimize things as you go. It's really hard. It's actually quite painful. You need to be, be able to get feedback. You need to have some sort of evaluation so that when you've completed that stage, you know that it's time to move on to the next harder level. And controversially, I put an X next to this one because Ericsson stuff comes from well-established fields where you can easily identify elite performers. And we have a problem in medicine because I've already said we've got this whole porn pornography issue. But the other thing is, is that, um, is that uh, our field is rapidly evolving. So we're often having to learn how to teach new things that have just occurred. And what's the best way to teach it? We don't always know. Not that we shouldn't try. And then also controversy, I've put a tick next to this one because I think really for true deliberate practice, it needs to be guided by a coach, a coach who's an expert coach. And I think we, have, we can have access to content experts, we can have access to simulation and education experts, but it's not always possible that we can get them there when we need them and do it with the regularity that we might, that we might want. But even if we can't, fulfill all these requirements of deliberate practice by having clear tasks, by being um, focused and doing repetition, by being at the edge of our ability, out of our comfort zone, we can certainly do purposeful practice. And if we're using simulation that is authentic, meaning that it's, uh, it will translate into the real world, then it seems self-evident that simulation can help with that. So. How do we deliver it if we're going to be involving experts uh, or trying to develop expertise and maintain expertise? 
So there's always a tendency, as we uh, sort of heard just there, of just going fully spinal tap on them and turning it up to 11 and cranking it all out. And we've also heard that uh, there's a lot of different types of stresses, and they're not necessarily all equivalent. So we've got to think about what is it that we're wanting to do, because we can, we can adjust environmental stresses, the noise, the ambience, how loud the alarms are. We can adjust individual stresses, like how tired they are, sleep deprived, et cetera. We can introduce interpersonal stress, arguments between people, all that friction that we know and love. And then, of course, there's um, uh, that, oh, I've just forgotten what it was, so we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> uh, th th there's, there's other stuff that you can do apart from introducing stresses per se. So you can add in complexity. There's one patient there, one patient there. It gets harder and harder the more patients you have or having one patient with multiple things happening at once, as we've already heard about. All of this, though, really um, factors into this idea of a signal-to-noise ratio. Has anyone found Wally or Waldo for any North Americans in this picture yet? <laughs> so this is where a large part of the preparation for my talk went into this, because I decided to have this concept, and I really regretted not having my five-year-old son to help me find uh, Wally before I did this. So the, this whole task is difficult because of the noise, right? So it becomes easier if we cut down on the noise. And it becomes even easier if we strengthen the signal. Hopefully, round about now, you've, fi you've found Wally. So, <laughs> so you, you can have the barn door tension pneumothorax that you need to diagnose and treat. But if it's not barn door, you know, they've also had cardiac surgery and they might have a bit of tamponade going on or other causes of hypotension, it gets trickier and trickier. So when I'm delivering a simulation and I'm looking at how I'm going to challenge people, that's one of the real um, important concepts that I'm thinking about when I'm delivering it. Another one is this idea, and I, um, I stole this a bit off uh, Tom Evans, this idea of what's happening with their cognitive bandwidth when I'm delivering it. Because as we've heard, when you're, under, you're, when you're putting stresses on people, we're actually narrowing down that cognitive bandwidth. And we can also choose various things that we can fill up this working space with. And when we're doing that, we're, I guess the way I look at it is we're, we're giving them a chance to see how they can manage that cognitive load. But we're also really testing what their mental models are, how well formed they are, and whether they survive under the stress. And because that's what we want to do, really, isn't it? If we want to make people improve, we need to find the chinks in their armor before we can actually work on those. So that's what we should be doing. OK. And so I've already talked about all the various stresses and stuff that can be at play. Um, and, uh, and I've already talked about that idea of that we can introduce different aspects of complexity. And obviously, another important one is the time pressure, so uh, increasing the rate at which patients deteriorate is another way to do it. But one of the problems that we have when we're doing this is I, I don't have the virtue of the, of the lab environment and being able to assess adrenaline and cortisol in real time and knowing how much pressure people are under at any given time. So I guess uh, it's a bit of an art form, isn't it, to try and think, well, is that person under much pressure or not? And I guess one of the other things I look at as they're going through it is, are they making mistakes or how rapidly they are moving through the scenario? But another way to get the level of difficulty right is this idea of choosing your own adventure, which one of my colleagues, Ian Summers, talks about. So if you've got a bunch of experts, get them to share what their, their challenging scenarios were and build the simulation experience around those. Because if it was challenging for one expert, chances are it will be challenging for the next one. You probably, it's kind of like one of these choose your own adventure books, but you probably haven't read this one. Uh, and then the other way I look at simulation is almost like a game of snakes and ladders. So if they are moving through it quickly, they're not making mistakes, well, then maybe I should start throwing them some snakes. So add in a little bit more complexity. Uh, they've just intubated the asthmatic. Is it dynamic hyperinflation? If they rapidly disconnect the ventilator, well, I've still got a few minutes up my sleeve, so let's make it a pneumothorax instead and things don't get better. Now what? Uh, so, and if they are struggling, well, then 
I'm going to have confederates embedded into the simulation to give them some ladders and help them progress through the scenario. And then one other sort of strategy with the actual design or delivery of the sim simulations that I like is increasingly thinking about this idea of rapid cycle debriefing. And Daniel Cabrera has this concept of live, die, repeat. Uh, so um, you have your scenario. There's a, basically a time limit before the patient's going to deteriorate. If, uh, if the participants don't get through it, the patient dies. You stop, you talk about it, you debrief it. You can rewind, do it again. And they'll come out on a high after that and then take them to the next level and step it up. And it's a really powerful thing to do. So I've talked a lot about there, really about kind of how, it's, uh, how we can deliver simulation and adjust the level of difficulty, which is really important. But what about this idea of, so most of us are doing simulation with novices or more junior people. Well, what can we do with actual experts when they're in? What, what's different? Well, I think it's mostly the same. I think we still need to do good planning. We need to do a pre-brief and set things up right. And then we need to deliver the sim and debrief it well afterwards. Uh, but having done it now with, um, in the unit regularly for the last couple of years and running other courses, et cetera, where we often have experts who come in, there are some things that are a little bit different. One of the big concerns we had when we first started doing this was this idea of experts, our consultants, losing face in front of other people. And we actually did consultant-only simulation, which... Uh, I don't think is the way to do it, and I'll touch on that again soon. Uh, also, experienced clinicians often aren't as familiar with just being involved in simulation as maybe our medical students coming through where this is just all, you know, expected. But I haven't found that to be a big barrier. I've also found that I think most experts, the moment they start hearing those alarms going and the SATS monitors dropping, they can create psychological fidelity. They've got all this experience that they can bring to it where they just fill in the gaps and will get stuck in. But there is always a chance that this can trigger some memories about maybe things that didn't go so well in the past because they've got a much wider experience. So that's something to think about as well. In particular, when it comes to the debriefing, we're often not talking about what you should do. That's people know what needed to be done. Often the conversation is about, well, what's the best way to do it? How to get it done most efficiently? And often that involves a discussion of um, non-technical skills and the CRM type stuff that we're doing. And that's why I think the advocacy inquiry or debriefing with non-good judgment approach really, really works with experts. Although I do always think, and we've touched on this earlier, that I, I'm very much thinking about this idea that experts have these mental models, these intuitions that they do things. And then often when we talk about it, maybe we're just getting the post hoc rationalizations of why they think they did something rather than why they actually did it. And for me, that's a big unknown. Uh, but I think just this concept of using simulation as part of <laughs> purposeful practice to develop and maintain expertise is quite narrow-minded. I think we should be doing a lot more. And, uh, and I've been persuaded by this, by this, partly from looking at things like what the astronauts do and other work that like Vic Brazel's done and um, my own experiences in our unit. So I think it's important to have experts as participants in simulation because they're role models. They're role models in a number of ways. One, just the management of the clinical condition that they're dealing with there, that the nurses and the other junior doctors can uh, learn from. But they become role models about how to learn and how to get better. And that can help change the culture of your department. And that's really important. We have to learn to learn from failure and know that failure is OK. And in fact, we need failure, as um, we, we heard earlier from Garrett, uh, that that's absolutely critical. We need to make mistakes in order to learn. And uh, but you're thinking, well, how do you get buy-in into that? How do you get experts involved? Well, one of the ways is to kind of trick them into it and say, we're going to run this sim um, not to teach you anything, yeah. <laughs> but to teach the others or to test out our system. So we need to figure out what the, the latent safety threats are. Let's do this in situ with a real team. Uh, 
make sure that everyone knows where to find the equipment, that we've got our system all working right, and then we can feed it back and try and get things um, uh, improving. And our, our real experience came from developing our approach to ECMO CPR, which is a really complex, um, high pressure situation to be in. We have about 12 roles and we created role cards for each person because it doesn't happen that often and we have a very much a flash team that needs to come together and do it. But the way that we developed this, really, our whole system, was just over about three weeks. We ran about 20 to 30 simulations where we got uh, about a dozen consultants come in, we'd get in the room, we'd run through scenarios, we'd try this person stand there, we'd move the equipment around, do different roles, figure it all out, and we went through multiple iterations of this and we still refine it as we go. And now we try to use that system of how we develop now is to it's the skill maintenance and do that, you know, hopefully every month and, and keep it going like that. So uh, I think that's a really valuable thing that we can do. So I've talked a lot about this stuff, but uh, probably some of you are thinking, yeah, come on, is this really feasible? Uh, can we really do this? And that is, that is no doubt a big challenge because this is the environment that we work in, isn't it? You know what the barriers are. One, there's the ac access to the experts, but there's, it's busy. We don't have much time. We don't have much money. How do we actually do this? And uh, I have no magic answers to that. I think one of the key things are is, you know, we're hearing from the researchers, uh, bringing all this research out, telling us that this stuff works. And I think that's important. We've got to find ways of convincing our, our system, our, the people who employ us, the people who give us time, who give us money, that this is the way to go. And when we do this stuff, feed it back into the system. So uh, I, I really like those ideas of if you're doing insight to sim, you feed it back into your risk management system and say, hey, look, let's fill in a risk man. There's a problem here. When you have wins, when you uh, run out a post-cardiac arrest uh, a scenario, and it's done, and immediately afterwards the arrest happens, and it's the best one ever. You publicize it. You uh, uh, you uh, you sing your own praises. It's not something we necessarily do well. But there are big challenges to knowing what the dosing and what the timing of this all all this stuff should be. Uh, so finally, I just want to say that, um, so from my point of view, I think, look, there really is a role for simulation and developing and maintaining expertise. But I think we even need to think wider than that, that we need to get experts involved in it so that they can role model for others and really um, feed it back into the system so that the system gets better and better. There are big challenges, there are barriers, but I think we should do it. And after all, as Peter Safar said, it's up to us to save the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, one question that I've got for you before I open it to the floor is um, on the simulation side of things, I absolutely agree with you that when you talk about the often people, it's not that they don't know what to do, they don't do it for some reason and you're putting the stresses in there to see what happens when people are under stress as we've been talking about um, and the key bit to the why it didn't happen is often the non-technical skills um, but what I think is really difficult and what we haven't really touched on today yet is that debrief and how do you particularly when you're debriefing consultants and senior consultants in front of juniors how do you one how do you go about that debrief do you have a protocol for it and secondly um, rather than just saying, you didn't do this, how do you give them advice to, to make it better next time? What can they do to stop that happening? Mm. So paradoxically, I think the most important part of the debrief is the pre-brief, uh, because that's where you establish the psychological safety, the expectations about what's going to happen, and it's absolutely critical that you get that right at the beginning. Then I think when you're debriefing experts, one, that's a huge privilege. And I think if you're conveying that, uh, that attitude from the outset that really I'm going to be learning as much, uh, much as everyone else in the room, uh, then I think that goes a long way to, to, helping, um, uh, to helping the debrief. Then I think it's always good to have other experts in the room as well so that people can 
uh, one all share their knowledge, and you usually find that there's nobody has one right answer, and that's a big big issue. Is that often experts say, yeah, 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 but I, I want to know what to do next time, and sometimes you just can't tell them what that is, but you can give some ideas about things to work from. Uh, but in general, I've been really surprised uh, with with my experience that I haven't. And I must admit, I'm, I love debriefing anaesthetists about airway scenarios outside of the operating theatre the most. But it really hasn't been, <laughs> it really hasn't been a big issue. I, I've really found that it's probably a self-selecting group, that the people who will come and want to get involved in this, they really are wanting to get better and learn. And I think uh, we just have to be humble in the, face of, in the face of what we're dealing with. That's probably one of the challenges, getting the people that don't want to be involved in it involved. Particularly if you're looking at your ECPR and the rest of the hospital, how do you bring in the teams that maybe don't do that? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, it is always a battle. But sometimes you just have to wait for dinosaurs to die now. Chris, one of the questions I had was you mentioned that the focused repetitive practice was something that was very important, but also very difficult. What are some of the strategies that you guys use to repeat certain things but not repeat them too much in light of many of the logistical challenges we face? It sounds like the live, die, repeat thing might be a good idea. What other, um, what other things do you guys do? Um, so I think in terms of the, the feasibility, I guess one thing that we need to think about is exactly which things are, are really important. And obviously the rare and the life-threatening are going to be critical. And so things like uh, an emergency crike, I think we need to be revisiting that f frequently to stay up to up to speed. And um, you know, I have only done done one, and that's actually persuaded me that actually this stuff actually works. That practicing on a bit of plastic tubing and getting all that muscle memory and stuff, it actually pays off. It really does work. So you've got to think about exactly what it is that you're wanting to train and how often you need to do it. And there are big logistics there. And it is a big problem because um, while there is some data on some particular procedures about how often you should do things, it's not well worked out for everything that we want to do. So usually we're kind of saying, well, if we do anything, that's probably good. And also the sexy stuff like ECMO CPR, that's easy. Everyone wants to come and practice that and train it. But what about some of the other stuff? And it tends to fall by the wayside. I probably haven't answered your question. Uh, Chris, well, Chris, thank you very much for your expert performance delivery of the talk, uh, in particular the deliberate practice and the way you used the room. Uh, a couple of things, just one was, I think you talked a lot about modifying cognitive load for expertise. I guess the other way to think about that, and I'm wondering about your thoughts, is just to modify the level of expectation. So in fact, still have a very simple scenario, and yet obviously expect very different levels of performance from your interns compared to your consultants. Because I guess in my experience, the more complexity I add, the bit of authenticity starts to drop off because I can't actually create that. So um, that's the first one. Second one is coming back to your point about the debris in the work that we've just been doing, which you nicely answered our survey for. If we found that in situ debriefing, the relationships are just so much more important between the debriefer, and you've obviously got a really good one, but do you include that in your debrief, a sort of explicit acknowledgement that we kind of know each other and we have history, and that will impact on our conversation? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, so that second component, I think, is one of the really wonderful things about doing in situ and with your... Uh, with the people that you know and stuff. And it allows you to get away with a whole lot of shit too. Like, you know, sometimes you're just like, what the? F <laughs> and that's all you need to say. And then they'll debrief the rest. And they know that you're, you know, they know that you're not assessing them, all that sort of stuff. So it's just like, that's it. And you can just sit back and watch. Um, the, uh, it is a challenge that other, the, the first part of your question, um, uh, being measuring the standard of performance because I, you know, you people who know me know that I'm nihilistic about most th most things, and I really, I'm really honest when I say at the start there about how do you know what elite performance is? How, you know, how do you know when someone is doing something really well? And I guess often we're if we're thinking about just the speed of task completion, 
Well, that's not everything because uh, sometimes if you do take a little bit longer to do it, maybe you're actually doing it better. So, uh, yeah, I don't have, again, a great answer to that, but it's something that uh, yeah, I do think about. Do you have one more question? Um, so Chris Atfield, great Canadian, uh, accomplished astronaut, horrendous musician. <laughs> like, if you, seriously, you have to listen to him. Play. You tried playing guitar in outer space. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that gets exactly my point. I mean, it's make your ears bleed, want to end your life bad music. And yet, he won't stop making music albums. You have to give, he keeps recording albums. They're all horrible. And part of the problem, I think, is because he's... An astronaut, and he takes a certain amount of confidence in his abilities as an astronaut. So of course he can do this as well. Please download his music and listen to it, and try not to commit suicide. <laughs> the question. Oh, there is a question. <laughs> I had to get that off my chest as a Canadian. The question is, what, what's your experience been in encountering non-expert experts or people who perhaps have more confidence in their abilities than they're able to demonstrate in the simulation exercise? And how do you nuance that discussion, given what Vic had just mentioned about how you typically have a relationship with those people as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, one, I'm kind of lucky that I, everyone I work with is better than me. So, 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 so that, 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 is a, um, that is an important thing. But I think it's certainly in my workplace, I think now we, we very much we do have a very good culture. Now, everyone knows that they can't be expert at everything. And there's this, this willingness that they do want to find the chinks in their armor. Running courses and stuff where other people have come in from different backgrounds and sometimes they might be quite isolated independent practitioners. It, it can be very interesting to see that they're doing something that's 20 years old or they've um, just created this, this thing there. And again, I think all, the, the main thing you can do is just make it safe for them at the outset and really set those expectations right and just say, look, you know, we. I, Look, if no one makes any mistakes here, then we're not going to learn anything. So let's make it happen. And it's also always very tricky because simulation is an artificial environment. Would they, would they be behaving the same in a different setting in the real world? And we've heard about you know, the differences between socio-evaluative stress and the stress of someone dying. For a large number of people, the former is much worse than the latter. And, and so it's hard to tease out. But I think we just have to be compassionate sometimes. I think we might have to just leave it there um, because we're already running into lunch. But um, Chris is going to be around all day if people have got questions. Um, so if I, please join me in thanking um, all of our speakers, Chris, um, Sam, Vicky, and uh, it was a fantastic session. And uh, if I can get everyone to come back after lunch, uh, we've got 45 minutes, so back at 13.30.